I would like to introduce Vern R. Walker from Morris A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. Vern Walker has been, I've been meeting him in the artificial intelligence law community for quite some time now, and his interests are close to mine. He combines an interest in legal reasoning, in software building, and in also the theory underlying all these things. So he really fits the subtitle of our event. He integrates uh, the legal perspective, the philosophical philosophical perspective and the computational perspective. He is a professor of law and the director at the Research Laboratory for Law, Logic and Technology. He has been, or maybe is still, but he can clarify that, a partner in a law firm. Yes, in Washington, New York. I was in practice for years. Yeah. And a doctorate in philosophy, so he has all the credentials. He built software himself, so that's very nice. Vern, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Bart, and thank you, uh, Marcello, for uh, organizing this excellent day and for inviting me uh, to your beautiful campus. Um, so today, I mean, this afternoon, I'm going to, this is a follow-on to a number of things we've been talking about. I'm definitely going to be on the descriptive side rather than the normative side. And I'm going to talk about the computational representation of legal reasoning at the law fact interface. Throughout, I want to emphasize that I consider empirical foundation to be essential uh, for uh, this study. I take Wittgenstein very seriously. Don't think, but look. Uh, what I take as input, uh, legal documents, texts, statutes, regulations, appellate decisions, give us the legal rules that balance the competing policy objectives. And the judicial and administrative decisions, the adjudications, give us the findings of fact and the reasoning that balance the evidence, rules, and policies. And also give us uh, the opportunity to study patterns of argumentation and reasoning that are successful and unsuccessful over multiple actual cases. But in order to generate this data, we need standards for adequately representing the actual patterns of language that we observe, and in order to create sets of data, or corpora, as the linguists uh, call them, uh, that are comparable and interoperable, so we can gather data to actually look for patterns. Uh, I, in particular, have been studying uh, fact-finding corpora, um, that is, the reasoning from the evidence in the record to the findings of fact, and a number of desirable properties for generating that data. Um, you need sets of uh, adjudicatory decisions, uh, whether judicial or administrative. Uh, we've been talking most of the, of the day about uh, criminal cases with juries, but there are vast numbers of administrative adjudications uh, with administrative law judges uh, and um, uh, civil cases uh, with bench trials or non-jury trials. Uh, adjudicatory decisions, the decisions uh, hopefully are well articulated, explaining the reasoning. They're fact intensive, because we want to get a rich uh, database. Uh, hopefully a high enough volume that we can generate enough data to search for patterns. Um, if I want to look for fact-finding, I like to have cases with uh, low el rule elaboration. That is, the rules remain relatively constant for subsets of cases, so we can uh, the rules aren't changing on us. We just look at the fact-finding patterns and hopefully with repeat fact finders so we can uh, distinguish between fact finders. And also we can, uh, unlike juries, we can uh, study the role of policy on fact finding. I'm going to talk about the law fact distinction, uh, why, a few uh, reasons. It's a fundamental, ubiquitous legal concept in US law. 
Um, it's also a concept uh, important because uh, presiding judges and appellate courts use it to organize and oversee the fact-finding operations of the fact-finder. It's also a concept that's used to play dynamic language games among important legal actors, for example, appellate judges and courts, presiding trial judges, fact-finders, parties, witnesses, and some of the things we want to study are the gaming moves of the uh, players. Example of a concept that interacts with other important legal concepts. So I'm going to be talking um, more concretely about legal presumptions in civil litigation, uh, which provides a useful concrete focal point for studying dynamics at the law of fact interface. So in the amount of time that I have, I can just give you a bunch of pictures. And, I, and that's really what I want to do. Um, so that uh, some of the legal concepts involved in fact-finding, any adjudicatory proceeding starts with a set of issues of fact. They're determined by the rules. The need, is, the proceeding is to create an evidentiary record in the case, uh, evidence, witness testimony, documents, and so on is produced into the record in the case and uh, what we call the law of admissibility, the law of evidence governs the admissibility of evidence into the record. When you get things in the record, what it's relevant to proving of the various issues of fact uh, is the issue of relevance. If we focus on any particular issue of fact, we can uh, look at all of the relevant evidence in the record and determine whether it's sufficient for a reasonable fact finder uh, to uh, find that issue. And the fact finding function, uh, assessing the probative value of the relevant evidence and deciding uh, whether it proves uh, uh, the issue of fact or not. Um, on top of this, I want you to think about, I'm thinking about, you know, we've been talking a lot today about inference as a logical process. In law, inference is a social process. The proceeding is designed to make an inference. Uh, that's what the fact finding is about. Well, some, what are some of the roles focusing on the law fact interface? Uh, admissibility of evidence, I think, is a combination of law and fact. Uh, we don't often think of it that way, we legal professionals, uh, but I'm thinking of situations like a Daubert hearing where the trial judge is deciding whether to admit the expert testimony, and in the process, she decides a number of factual issues by a preponderance of the evidence, and she gets deference on review, and all of those are the traits of fact-finding. So I think it's a complex, within a Daubert proceeding, it's a complex mix of law and fact. Relevance also, we often think of the jury, uh, the fact-finder decides, and I do mean by fact-finder, the administrative law judge, the jury, the uh, presiding uh, judge in a, in a bench trial. Um, Complex law and fact, very much a fact finder function, but the law has rules about what you cannot consider that's in the record, but uh, for a particular issue, so there's a mix there. Sufficiency of evidence we often think of as a law issue, uh, an issue of law. Um, law and fact on the probative value, because uh, even if you have sufficient evidence, um, very often it's a fact finder issue, but if the court considers the evidence conclusive, it will decide as a matter of law uh, on the issue of fact. So we get uh, law fact uh, interplay there as well. Uh, focusing more on presumptions, some basic concepts, uh, you know these, law and fact, all I'm thinking, let's keep it simple, an issue of law is decided by the presiding judge of the appellate court, de novo, Issues of fact are decided by the fact finder. Burden of proof, burden of two kinds of burdens. Burden of production is putting things into the record that are sufficient for the fact finder to make a finding. Um, who has that burden? Burden of persuasion 
is that uh, who loses in case you fail to persuade the fact finder about the probative value of the relevant evidence under a particular issue. Probative value of evidence on any particular issue of fact then has this range from um, insufficient evidence, which is an issue of law, through a range where the jury or fact finder is entitled to uh, find either way, um, or that it's conclusive, which is again an issue of law for the courts on the high end. So here's a schematic of uh, the, the standard presumption rule. It's the form of a presumption of a certain kind, but uh, common in law. Um, if P, proposition P, is proved to be true by the proponent, and these are civil cases I'm talking about, so by a preponderance of the evidence, then Q, some other proposition, must be presumed or deemed to be true by the fact finder, unless not Q, the negation of Q, is proved to be true by the opponent, by a preponderance of the evidence, provided P does not entail Q. Now that last part is just that if P entails Q, then you don't have what we normally consider a presumption, you just have a rule of law. Um, this is the, uh, for those um, uh, familiar with the terminology, this is a Morgan McCormick interpretation of legal presumption. There are other interpretations. Um, I always think of propositions in legal rules in adjudications as three-valued. Everything starts out undecided, and the litigation process, the uh, uh, parties are trying to convince the fact finder uh, that something is true or false. Uh, terminology you may be familiar with, P is uh, the basic facts, uh, Q is the presumed fact, and not Q is the defeater proposition. So it's a, a general form of legal presumptions. An example of a presumption, in, um, of a rule-based presumption, in, from the uh, National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, the Vaccine Act, uh, where I do a lot of my research. Um, it established in the United States a vaccine injury compensation program. And if you get uh, vaccinated with a covered vaccine uh, and you suffer what you think is a side effect, you file a claim uh, for compensation for injuries allegedly caused by the vaccines. If the, and it's a claim against the government, a fund uh, in the Treasury, so it is a, it's in the Court of Federal Claims. Um, the contested cases that the government contests, the issues are decided by special masters as fact finders, um, so no jury. Uh, they write extensive decisions explaining their reasoning. Uh, they get deferential review by the courts for findings of fact and non-deferential review by the courts on issues of law. So that's a nice place to study uh, the difference between law and fact. And great issue involved here of causation. It's the really difficult issue, um, whether the vaccine caused the injury. So here we have... Legal case, remember I want to go back to, I'm all about the data and how to represent the data in, in a computational form. Uh, here's the data, published case, Althan versus Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, the background, the claimant, the uh, highlighting down there alleged that she suffered uh, optic neuritis and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis ADEM as a direct result of a tetanus toxoid vaccination. Now this was, this is a case in the federal circuit. The, uh, the appellate court that oversees this program, immediately oversees this program, this is the place that case law gets made. Here's an example, uh, this is from the same uh, decision uh, further down in the text, um, where we get rules. Uh, she must prove, that's often the petitioner, uh, by preponderance of the evidence that the tetanus toxoid vaccination caused her malady. 
That's her burden of proof. How does she prove that? Well, Alton's burden, so next column, next paragraph, they explain how Alton goes about this, more rules. Alton's burden is to show by preponderant evidence three things. One, a medical theory causally connecting the vaccination and the injury. We're going to see these three some more, so don't think you have to understand them at this point. She has to show a logical sequence of cause and effect showing that the vaccination was the reason for the injury. And she has to show approximate temporal relationship between vaccination and the injury. Now, once the Federal Circuit in Alton said this, wrote these sentences, filed the opinion, these were rules governing the system and governing the special masters and the lower court. Uh, they are uh, three things you have to prove. If you prove those things, then you have proved um, that the vaccination caused the malady. Unless the government shows, also by preponderant evidence, that the injury was in fact caused by factors unrelated to the vaccine. Now, some of that language comes from Knudsen, uh, an earlier uh, Federal Circuit case, and some of it uh, comes from the statute. So if we put this into our, put what we got from the Alton case into our presumption format, uh, combination of the Vaccine Act, a section, and Alton, if the petitioner proves that a medical theory causally connects the type of vaccination and the type of injury. Now, I put those brackets in there. Other case law elaborates. What they're talking about here is the medical theory connects the type of vaccine you got and the type of injury you had. This is the kind of thing you can prove from medical literature. It's not about this case as such. The next two are about this case. Petitioner has to prove that a logical sequence of cause and effect shows that the vaccination, the vaccination, her vaccination, was the injury, uh, the reason for the injury, her injury. These quotes are their language. I mean, you know, I would have written it differently, but the law is what the Federal Circuit says it is. Um, in the particular case, and three, she has to prove approximate temporal relationship existed between her vaccination and her injury. Now, if she does that, then it's presumed that the vaccination caused the injury, unless the government proves that the injury was due to factors unrelated to the vaccination. In her particular case, something else explains it all. <clears throat> now, what we study, oh, so here's a uh, graphic tree view of the same um, things. to the injury, to the vaccination, excuse me. Um, the next case I'm going to show you is a special master's decision written under this set of rules, and it's going to focus on uh, Alton uh, prong one there, the medical theory. Here's, a, um, here's the title, top of the title page. Uh, we download the PDFs from the court website uh, this is a copy of the decision as filed. Office of Special Masters, filed December 12, 2005. The petitioner was Shannon Casey. Uh, you see uh, Sweeney was the special master in the case, and then the decision follows. Now, I picked out a couple of paragraphs of text from page 26 of the Casey decision. Notice there is a heading, Petitioner has met her burden. Uh, but I want you to look at the English text of what's going on here. Um, first sentence, Special Master Sweeney uh, states the Alton rule as Sweeney understands it. Uh, direct quote. Um, 
as summarized by the Federal Circuit in Altham, petitioner will prevail only if she proves more likely than not, quote, so on, one, two, three. Then a citation. Then the sentence, the special master is convinced that petitioner has made the requisite showing in this case. Now, that first sentence is Sweeney's articulation of the legal standard for the case. The last sentence is Sweeney's finding of fact uh, covering, covering the three, um, although the word finding doesn't occur there. Uh, next paragraph. First, petitioner has provided sufficient proof of a medical theory of causation. Now, the word first and the phrase uh, medical theory of causation and provided sufficient proof shows us that this paragraph, hopefully, if reasonably written, supports the conclusion, the finding effect on the first Alton condition, the arrow up there. And then subsequent paragraphs talk about the other ones. This is a very well-written decision. Uh, then I've highlighted a number of um, uh, what uh, in linguistics uh, we call the propositional content of these sentences. This is the natural language document, but what's the operative legal language of the reasoning? Um, the next uh, two sentences, what I've highlighted in kind of a salmon color, uh, the, um, there were two possible mechanisms. So the question is, what's the medical theory connecting this type of vaccination and this type of injury? Well, there were two theories, two possible mechanisms. One was a direct viral infection, and the other one was an immune-mediated inflammatory response inside of Sweeney's, uh, inside of um, um, Casey's body. What I've highlighted, and then the rest of the reasoning supports both branches, but what I've done is highlighted in blue, uh, the propositional content that shows you the supporting reasoning for the first branch, the direct viral infection. So it goes like this, if you just look at the blue and ignore the non-highlighted. A natural varicella infection can trigger both of these reactions. That is, the wild virus can give you this infection. The virus in the varicella vaccine is attenuated. Ah, the way this vaccine is made is they take a live virus and they attenuate it, weaken it, so presumably, hopefully, it doesn't hurt anybody. But, third point, notice, it is reasonable to assume that. Uh, we've got a very weak inference going on here, but the virus can multiply once inside, the virus from the vaccine can multiply once inside the body and thus also trigger the reactions, like the wild virus, which in turn could be directed at and negatively affect the nervous system, which is the complaint uh, and respondent's expert did not respond, and that's the government, the other side, the opponent, did not dispute the theoretical possibility of causation, but did contend that such a reaction would occur very rarely. Now, one thing that we do in the lab is pull out the reasoning from the natural language document and display it, uh, often in a form like this, this isn't the graphic tree form, could have done that. This is a little more compact. It's a um, nested uh, text tree uh, that displays in a browser. This is HTML. Uh, at the top, and this is just a slice of, I mean, this whole Casey decision, the reasoning in it is represented in one single tree the conclusion at the top, in this case, Casey wins. Um, so you're just getting a little snapshot of this part that models the paragraph I showed you. Uh, she has to prove medical theory causally connects the vaccination to her encephalomyeloneuritis. Um, then we get the finding, which was the first sentence, helpfully, from the paragraph. Petitioner provided sufficient proof of a medical theory of causation. Then we get the branching, 
And I don't have time and don't want to go into what these connectives mean, the max and the mins and so on. They're generalized forms of conjunction and disjunction for many valued logics. That's what they are. Uh, but there's two branches. One is, well, it could cause a direct viral infection or an immune-mediated inflammatory response. What's the support for the first branch? Well, it really has two parts, uh, logically enough. The varicella vaccine can cause a direct viral infection, and at the bottom, the direct viral infection can negatively affect the nervous system, because that's how she gets compensation. The support for the first assertion has these four parts. Natural varicella infection can cause a direct viral infection. So now we've extracted from the natural language the logical structure of the reasoning as reported by Special Master Sweeney. The varicella vaccine contains a live but attenuated virus. It can multiply once inside the body and trigger a direct viral infection, and respondents' effort to, uh, uh, expert did not dispute the theoretical possibility of causation, but did contend that such a reaction would occur very rarely. Now, our goal in the lab at this stage of the research is just to accurately represent descriptively the reasoning that's in the decision. Now, we can go on to critique the reasoning that we see or ask questions like, well, is this a pattern? Do we see it in other cases, fact-finding cases, by other special masters, or only by Sweeney again? Um, is it a policy-based presumptive pattern? Well, take a look at it. One and two of the four, if you prove a natural varicella, uh, uh, the natural virus can cause the effect, and your vaccine was made with a live virus, then those might be the basic facts. Then we presume, or Sweeney is willing to presume, or assume, um, that it can multiply inside some people's body and cause the same thing that the wild virus would, at least so long as, unless the government proves otherwise. But all of that is an interpretive overlay of a presumption of a possible pattern on top of what Sweeney wrote, which is the data. Problems in computation. Okay. Um, we're wrapping up. Problems in, for computation. Uh, locating and identifying in full text legal documents those sentences that perform critical logical roles. They are not easy to find. For example, the, identify the sentences that state the legal rules, the ones that, that identify presumption elements, findings of fact, testimony of a witness. Um, and adequately represent the meaning of such legal text, not only the semantics of the declaratory declarative sentences as a function of the constituent words, but we're talking about reasoning, which means also the pragmatics. These are linguistics uh, sub-areas. Pragmatics of sentences within the linguistic and legal context, including the relevant propositional content. How do you do that? How do people do that? How do lawyers do that? Can computers do that? Those tasks. But let me wrap up with, since this is law and rationality, and you knew I was going to get this in here somewhere, Wittgenstein, NLP, and app design. Um, Wittgenstein. Uh, the meaning of language is its use in human activities, forms of life, language games, he called them. Uh, Rule-governed linguistic uh, interplay within uh, human activities. Within any form of life, playing a language game in an acceptable way involves spotting a mistake and applying words. Counting, uh, naming, we do uh, many of these things, but also making inferences. Uh, think of inference-making 
as a complex of language games that people do. Um, is there any further objective um, uh, reality to it? Or um, how do we go about studying it? The question I asked earlier about um, do we hold jurors to a standard of, of Bayes' theorem? The Bayes' theorem tells us the truth, the jurors are wrong, or the juror is telling us something about degrees of warrant? So no. Philosopher's task, Wittgenstein this is, describe the rules of play within language games and provide a description of the language game. It's similar to the task of grammar. Don't think, but look. See how people speak. Wittgenstein, NLP, Natural Language Processing and App Design. Well, we're dealing with the human-machine interaction, devising representations of meaning for these texts that are both human-readable and machine-readable. I think that's one of our major tasks, uh, to bridging the human-machine interaction. So some things are more familiar to humans, tree graphics, HTML trees, as long as uh, the machine can also uh, use the information uh, to compute. Um, and our, our underlying models are in uh, markup languages like XML. Representations of meaning are a function not only of semantics, but pragmatics, as I said. And it's not just, so the context of the sentence. How do you know that the sentence is a finding and not the testimony of a witness? It's easy if the sentence says, the witness testified that X, I find that X, but very often all you find is the sentence X in the text. There's also the extra document context, uh, the role of the special master's decision within the legal system compared to the federal circuit's sentence when they write it in the legal system. And I think we need uh, logic supplemented with linguistics and empirical data on legal reasoning patterns if we're going to do the natural language processing uh, adequately. And finally, the app design. What does this have to do with app design? Uh, well, I actually find it useful, especially these days, to think of the functional elements of uh, web software apps or mobile apps. Um, three functional concepts, the model, which contains the data, the XML file, the controller that takes the model data and uh, displays it or does something with it, and the view, which is the interactive display with the user. Now, those of you who use Word, um, these concepts, the, the, your document data is stored in an XML file, that docx file, if you change the extension, it's a zip file that just zips up a bunch of XML documents. The Word software is the controller that takes the data and presents the view that you want to work with. Sometimes it's the print view, sometimes it's the outline view. It's all operating with the same data. If you want to see it on your cell phone, you need a different kind of controller, but the data is the same. Um, apps are frameworks, putting a bunch of this together, uh, within which new language games are being played within evolving forms of life. I think that's what's going on in the legal profession. Legal corpora annotated for meaning are needed for research things like spotting patterns so that we can critique them, um, human education, teach law students more efficiently, uh, and machine learning, and providing cost-effective, high-quality legal services as support software for lawyers, and improving access to justice for underrepresented parties. One of the things that we look at is using software in, uh, to assist in pro se cases where people can't afford attorneys. Conclusions, law fact distinction plays a critical role in legal reasoning. Legal presumptions is a good uh, concrete example of that. We need standards for creating empirical data so that we can all, we can all study texts 
and mark them up in ways that uh, we can create data so we can pool our data and study successful, unsuccessful patterns of legal argumentation or reasoning. For that, we need corpora, like the vaccine uh, decisions. And um, I think where we're headed is we need a combination of linguistics and logic to create apps for generating and using those data in corpora. So I think that's where we are at the law and rationality interface. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vern Walker. Next speaker is Bart Verhey. Um, so Bart Verhey will comment on uh, Vern Walker talk. He's a resident fellow at the Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford Law School. He's a tenured lecturer and researcher, and I like to say this because it's very long, at the University of Groningen Institute of Artificial Intelligence and Cognitive Engineering, abbreviated ALICE. Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. And his research focuses on artificial intelligence, argumentation, and law, and he's currently leading a project uh, on integrating these three frameworks to formalize and understand legal reasoning, uh, the argumentation framework, the story framework, and the probabilistic framework, which Henry Pracker uh, described earlier. Um, please welcome me in joining Barbara Hay. Strange to now be in this role. I had another role, the whole role of host until now. So my response to Vern, and I will ride a few of my hobby horses while responding to yours. So here's one of my first hobby horses for today, one of three, the cognitive systems triangle. So during my dissertation work already, I needed the perspective of, of understanding how all these different kinds of people think about matters differently. So cognitive systems, they are systems that model in some way cognition, reasoning processes, things like that. And it was helpful for me to de develop this triangle of thinking about these things where different biases of looking at cognition are emphasized. So some people emphasize the natural side of cognition. That's, let's say, the idea of how people actually reason. Others think Theoretically, that's where the philosophers are, where the logicians are, and where the statisticians are, perhaps. And others are studying artificial systems. So that's where the people are who build software, who build expert systems, who build robots, perhaps. And you see all kinds of people having different sets of biases inside this triangle. So one of my heroes was, and still is, John R. Pollock, and he was in, in the middle of that triangle. He, both, uh, he, also, he looked at natural argumentation, he built software, and he was a the theoretician and epistemologist. And now I noticed while preparing these, these, resp this, these responses to you, Vern, that you are also in the middle. You are clearly a theoretician. You are a philosopher thinking about the nature of things and relevant concepts. You are also looking at, let's say, logical models of some kind that fit the legal system and then especially focusing on the law-fact distinction. You are building software and you are now always telling me that you should look at what is really happening. You should look at the data. So you are currently strongly emphasizing perhaps the natural side of what really happens, but you are really at the heart of this cognitive systems triangle. Very nice. So then a, th a second hobby horse of mine, argumentation software and the design of that. So you already mentioned the possibility of having graphical diagrams of arguments and you have a specific format for that that is based on your, uh, your version of, uh, of, a, of default logics, let's say. And here you see my uh, software 
in which I incorporated my version of, of, of def defeasible argumentation inside a program that can at least manage the, the, the reasoning that people input into such software. And then the th third hobby horse, and that's a, a little bit irrelevant, or I'm not sure you will be able to comment on that after my comments. That's the role of probability in connection to argument strength. And that is something that has been at the heart of at least this event in several talks today also. But I think that there is a relevance also with you because you are interested in learning and seeing patterns in data. And then I think that probability is close. And I look at the con uh, connection between probability and argument strength in a way that is, I think, in almost direct opposition to what Susan Haag told us today. Namely, I believe that something like the conditional probability that connects the evidence to the hypotheses is a measure, if you like, of argument strength. The argument from the evidence to the interpretation of the evidence in the form of a hypothesis. I do not have time today to expand on my views, but at least this is my current perspective. And I think that it is very important to think about the connection between probability and argument strength. And this is one of the reasons also for organizing this event. So that leads me to three questions to you, Vern. So I'm a little bit concerned about my hobby horses in connection to what you and also people like you are doing and also what people, and I, I consider myself to be in your ballpark, let's say. So I'm also worried about my own program. And here are three questions that you may have something to say about. So the cognitive systems triangle. And now then especially also the role of data there. So is legal technology, AI and law, computational law, really ready for extracting knowledge from data. And also you, in, in, in what you said, told us, you speak about your lab and I think a lot of manual work in modeling the natural language that is inside actual uh, uh, decisions. So is the technology really ready for that? And you would want at a certain point maybe to also automate that a little bit or at least support the people that do the work. And then argumentation software and desi design of that. Are the formal and computational models that we have today already ready for legal practice? So is what we have now in terms of models and computational tools already sufficiently well developed to do what we want to do? So if you, for instance, think of our field, and uh, today we had uh, our, uh, Henry Pracken present his work, and now Vern, you are uh, presenting uh, other work that is coming from a similar background, namely artificial intelligence law, when you see what is going on there, you see a lot of differences. It is quite confusing for an outsider to manage the literature in the field because everybody has his own specific perspective or her specific perspective. And, well, you have to be an expert in the field to understand the slight differences between all these models. So are we already in the position to build formal and computational models that are ready for legal practice? And the third question is about probability and argument strength. How are probability and argument strength connected, do you think, uh, Fern? And let me give one example that I like to, uh, to, to quote that I've shown already at several talks here at Stanford. That is some court statistics in the Netherlands. 95% of the suspects that appear before a criminal court in the Netherlands are actually convicted. So well. That's beyond a reasonable doubt, right? If you appear before a court, then let's convict you. If I understood Sandy's uh, uh, example correctly, then many of the judges that were questioned by one of the other judges think that this 95% is above the threshold. So they are out of a job in a sense. When a suspect appears before a court in the Netherlands, you can convict him beyond a reasonable doubt. Of course, that's not true. There is something wrong here. And here are maybe some of the issues that, are, that, that matter. So apparently, we need more than a high correlation, a pattern between the evidence and the suspect's guilt. There is something more that we want. But what? The specifics of the case matter. Well, and also in your work, Fern, you show that very nicely because you also emphasize 
the natural language aspect, so the specific wordings of what is going on, the specifics of the case matter. So it is not just that you appear before the court, of course, that makes you guilty, although the pattern is there. And also the exceptional cases do matter. So some cases are strange, and that's something that is typical for the law. The law is typically about the hard cases, or at least that's the, the way many lawyers think about their own uh, job. What distinguishes this case from the other cases? So let me th say a few words about how I try to look at these things, and there is a manuscript that I wrote here uh, at Stanford about this. So the first thing about the high correlation, I have now uh, moved to a position in which you want to have kind of certainty in a theory about the case. So I go to, the, let's say, the 100% model uh, governed by a probability calculus. If you have a theory about a case and you want to decide about the facts at least beyond a reasonable doubt, then what you should have in your theory is certainty. Of course, that does not mean actual certainty, but in your theory about the case, you would like to have certainty. And then the specifics of the case matter. Well, and then we come to the project that was already mentioned. The circumstances should be modeled inside the theory about the case. The explanation about why a certain decision, why a certain perspective is the right one, should be inside the model. And the scenario is another way of, that's nice of looking at it. You will have to explain what has happened in the case, and then you go beyond, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the pattern that, uh, that was described by the statistics of, uh, of Dutch courts. And then finally, the exceptional cases do matter. So what you need is something like excluding all the reasonable alternatives. So that's the, the, the prevention of tunnel vision. So you include in your model all the different kinds of alternative interpretations of, of a case, different stories that matter, maybe different legal conclusions, and you will have to exclude in your theory about the case all these reasonable alternatives. Okay, that was my kind of answering of these questions. We need to develop technology towards integrating logic, argumentation, and probability theory following the lines that I showed you on the previous, previous slide that might actually also help develop formal and computational models as they are now uh, presented in the community of artificial intelligence and law. And finally, it shows one perspective on connecting probability and argument strength. And hopefully, that will also help, let's say, connecting uh, the modeling of, um, of legal cases using high volume data that you are looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. I will make some um, <clears throat> very quick answers so that we can talk, uh, all of us can talk. Uh, question number one is legal technology ready for extracting knowledge from data? Of course, the, the loaded term is knowledge. Um, I th the answer to that is yes, but it's going to take about 100 years. Um, there's a lot of theoretical work to be done. There's a lot of data to generate. Um, it's begun. Uh, people are doing it. It'll take a long time. Are formal and computational models of argument ready for legal practice? A great question. Um, my philosophical training was in uh, logic and philosophy of science as well as AI aspects. Um, and um, so when I started doing the kind of work that I do now, my first inclination was to take logic and, um, and uh, make uh, objects in the, in the software because, of course, I was going to need all those things. The, the truth is you don't need all those things. Uh, you need very, I mean, if, if your goal is to model what you find in the text, you just, the connectives we're used to using, uh, the level of symbolic uh, computation that we're capable of is generally not useful. Very little is used. You get excited if you find a modus ponens. Uh, articulated it, you know, reasonably well in the document. On the other hand, through the empirical work, um, I'm finding that we need other connectives 
that we generally didn't consider. I mean, uh, one, one obvious one is uh, relevant factors. So uh, very often what you just get is a list of reasons for a conclusion. They're not organized. You can think you can impose a structure on them, but the fact is they're just a list of reasons. You don't know, for example, are all of the things on the list necessary? So you can't make a conjunction out of them. Uh, you just know that under these circumstances, if these four things are true, then this person drew that conclusion. So there's a kind of sufficiency of a list without necessity of the elements. And I think we need a new connective for that. The reason that how we decide is empirically what we need to, to, do, the, to do the job. Uh, the last thing, um, by probability, I assume, uh, especially given Susan's talk this morning, we're talking about probability theory, Komogorov axioms there. And, um, and argument strength related, absolutely, sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> two examples. One, if the underlying chance setup that we have expert testimony on is, uh, is, is modeled by a probability system, then yeah, we need the expert testimony to tell us uh, whether the, um, the roulette wheel was uh, rigged or not. Um, the second thing is, and my second example to make it a different kind, sometimes the law takes something like hypothesis testing, statistical significance, and makes it a prima facie case of something like employment discrimination. Well, that's an action of law, taking a piece of statistics and inserting it into the legal system, and that happens. When those appellate courts say, this is how you prove X, if the this turns out to be probabilistic, learn at hand, right? If the, if the list turns, if the this turns out to be probabilistic, that's how we do it. Why? Because it's the legal rule. So uh, yeah, they're related uh, in more complex ways. But I'm going to stop there. Questions? I think you were first. Um, I'm, I think this is an enormously ambitious project you're undertaking. Um, have you gotten to the point where you've been able to use uh, your models or descriptions to critique uh, a legal opinion? And, and, and could you like give a quick example of how that might work? Well, I can use the example uh, <clears throat> that I gave you from Casey up there. I mean, there's a, that's a policy-driven, this is the if the live virus can do it uh, and uh, the vaccine's made with a live virus, then probably the vaccine can do it, at least sometimes, unless the government proves it can't. I mean, that complicated uh, business uh, I think is critiquable. But now when we step back and do critique, we probably aren't just thinking logic, we're thinking policy. I mean, what's going on in these vaccine cases, it's fascinating. They absolutely know that the legal standard of proof of causation is different from the scientific proof of the causation. These cases wouldn't be here if the scientists had figured out what the uh, tetanus toxoid vaccine can cause. Uh, and the courts know that, and Congress knew that, and there's this policy determination that people should win sometimes even if the science isn't there. It's a fundamental policy of the program. It doesn't answer the question, all right, but when should people win? Mm -hmm. but and, and, and we can critique, oh, they shouldn't, that's too weak evidence. You know, that live virus, maybe the live virus, that's too weak. But chances are, it isn't just going to be, oh, there's a gap in your reasoning, it's going to be, Deciding cases this way is not in the best interest of the program, policy reasons. So there's lots of levels of critique. Um, so I, I, I really love the, the exercise of, of corpus markup here and, and would in, encourage you to, to pursue that. I think it's, it's, it's potentially beautiful work. Um, 
I think I'd also encourage you to not sort of wait, you know, to sort of have that level of articulation and markup of the data in that, you know, you could throw this into text classification methods and just sort of see how well you can predict the outcome um, just from, you know, very superficial linguistic data. But there then I would say I think there's an interesting question of are these beautiful arguments that are laid out, and I assume they're not usually as beautiful as this particular special master, yeah. but are these beautiful arguments laid out an accurate representation of how the decision was made, or is it a story that's told after the fact? So for instance, if you analyzed a big corpus of data and you found that G, when it's a little blonde moppet, um, they always win, and when it's a 300 pound teenage drug addict, they always lose, um, then you know you would have sort of a, you would have some evidence that this is a story that's told, not that it's not that it's the actual way the decision came about. But but I think it's you know I think there's beautiful things that can be done here, and I think they can be done without necessarily this this very difficult markup. Well, we're we're definitely not doing psychology. We're not in Bill's field. We're not figuring out how did the human person figure this out. We are lawyers, and that is. What was the rationale that was given publicly as support? And that's what the law is about. And um, we can critique it. We can find patterns. We can find reasons for uh, more rules. We can advise the appellate courts on making more rules. Um, all of those kinds of things are possible. Uh, let me just say, I, we are, we do what we do kind of at the center of our little dizzy spiral. Um, in my lab, uh, but we collaborate with people. Uh, we have a collaboration project uh, with um, uh, engineers uh, who want to automate some aspects of our markup process, and so we provide the gold standard for them to train their, uh, 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 their uh, systems. Uh, the other things we, uh, we reach out to, we're uh, collaborating with a bunch of people to produce a gold standard of marked up torts cases on the rules side. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done there, but our approach is to, um, we do something at the heart of the spiral, which we think is of value to many different research and application communities. Rather than reproducing all that expertise in-house, we collaborate with people on projects. Um, I will just second your idea that um, instead of, I, I think you are, what I have understood and my understanding uh, might be wrong, that uh, you are analyzing the decision, like what um, the judge has said in the case. Uh, but I would go the other way around, like what the people have said in the case. And, uh, you know, then arrive on the uh, judgment and take away the biasings, uh, either from the jury or from the judges or from the even incompetent, uh, you know, lawyers. Many people uh, don't get competent lawyers. Yes, these decisions uh, generally contain, um, of course, this is the special master writing the decision. So there's a recounting of what this witness testified and what that witness testified. These are all cases with extensive medical records. We've got medical records of, you know, hospital visits and so on and so on. We've got testimony of experts. We have fact witnesses by the parents, for example, what was the child's behavior the night after the vaccination. So we get all of the combining scientific and non-scientific uh, evidence. Um, and you know, you could go back and do transcripts of the hearings. Uh, you could uh, get the expert reports and so on. Uh, so far, for efficiency reasons, we stuck with the rationale of the fact finder, but all of that stuff's available. And what I was saying and why it's a big project and why actually it would take at least 100 years, um, wherever you have high volume fact intensive cases, especially in healthcare, right? I mean, reducing the cost of healthcare, this, the vaccines are, re, are healthcare cases. Reducing the cost of healthcare means making claims systems more efficient 
helping people arrive more quickly at an assessment of the settlement value of their case, um, and uh, whether it's Social Security uh, disability cases, veterans disability cases, uh, black lung uh, minors cases, there are huge numbers of high volume fact intensive cases uh, that will provide the data. But we need a lot of people working on it, hopefully with a, statter, uh, with a standard for markup that then we can compare our data sets. Okay, last, last question. So my question is, what, what do you do if you, if you get, if you find an invalid argument you have many different options. I mean, you could emphasize that it is a fallacy or add an implicit premise to the argument to make it valid, that it's arbitrary, or be prepared to accept that some invalid arguments are non fallacious. I'm thinking, for example, about an argument from analogy or many other options, I, I guess. So what do you do? Well, it's, it's a great question, and, um, and part of it is the meaning of validity. Um, on uh, propositional logic, right? With propositional logic, uh, syllogisms are invalid. Um, so part of the question is, well, with a stronger logic, could this actually turn out to be a valid inference? But that's a lot of work, and it's a lot of critique and it's reading into the document something that isn't there because by the way you start, right? The, something's missing, a premise is missing. Um, we I recently did a count of um, a set of cases. I would say on uh, prong one and often, I would say about 80% of the units of reasoning, the arguments, were all just lists of factors. There, were, there weren't any conjunctions, there weren't any disjunctions. There was a conclusion and here's my list of reasons. Well, how do you even talk about validity of that, right? I mean, uh, you must be talking about the validity of your interpretation of the logical structure of the list of reasons, but that's not what was written. What was written was a list of reasons. But here's where we get back, and this is my absolute one. This is where we get back to, Human beings read that paragraph, see the conclusion, the list of reasons, and they say, yeah, over and over and over and over, and we can debate whether they're good Bayesians or not. But you can routinely find many reasonable people saying that's sufficiently supported conclusion. Is that validity? I don't know. Thank you very much.